Welcome to this week's Money Metals Podcast, helping gold and silver investors during these treacherous times. Now, here's this week's market wrap with commentary and analysis from the company voted 2015's Precious Metals Dealer of the Year in the U.S., Money Metals Exchange. Welcome to this week's Market Wrap Podcast. I'm Mike Leeson. Coming up, we'll hear from our good friend David Smith, senior analyst at the Morgan Report and regular contributor to MoneyMetals.com. David touches on some key events and potential developing scenarios in the metals markets right now, including the potential for a default on the exchanges, the possibility that the stage is being set for a massive short-covering rally in silver futures, and how much longer the market can withstand massive physical demand in the face of ever-constricting supply. Don't miss an incredibly important and informative interview with David Smith coming up after this week's market update. Well, as terror alerts are raised around the world, investors appear to be more focused on signals that are being sent by the oil market. Crude oil prices are plunging this week to their lowest levels since 2009 and are now on the verge of taking out those crisis lows. Are falling oil prices just a reflection of increased oil production, or could they also be indicating that the economy is heading south? That's the question that both investors and Federal Reserve officials will have to consider. Major cyclical declines in oil prices often correlate with economic contractions. So far, the U.S. stock market isn't following oil's path lower, but to a large extent, precious metals are. Gold and silver prices were unable to build on their pop from last Friday. They now find themselves back near the lower end of recent trading ranges. Gold prices currently come in at $1,074 an ounce for a weekly decline of 1.3%. Meanwhile, silver has dipped below $14 now and trades at $13.91, down 4.6% on the week as of this Friday morning recording. Low precious metals prices, low oil prices, low prices for virtually all commodities suggest that disinflationary pressures are likely to spread through the economy in the near term. It would be an odd backdrop for the Fed to begin raising rates, especially when its own inflation gauges are running well below its 2% target. It would also be odd for the Fed to raise while its major counterpart, the European Central Bank, is slashing rates ever deeper into negative territory as it did last week. That's not to say that Fed officials won't raise rates when they meet next week. Futures markets seem to think there's a good chance they will. Whether Janet Yellen and company hike may come down to how strongly they feel about the need to save face. The fact that they have talked and talked and talked and talked about raising rates this year puts them in a bit of a bind. They lose credibility by not raising. If they lose credibility, then they'll lose some of their ability to influence markets. The financial media may finally start to notice a pattern of their words and forecasts not ringing true, and that probably scares Fed officials more than any risks they see in the economy. Maybe they'll come up with some creative way of raising rates on one hand while providing stimulus on the other. Or perhaps they'll raise rates, but by less than a quarter of a point. All the speculation will be put to rest by next Wednesday when the Fed announces its decision Anything less than a quarter point hike would likely be viewed by the market as dollar bearish. Those seeking diversification away from the dollar and into hard assets have to be prepared for unpredictable price swings, whether caused by the Fed or other forces operating in the markets. Over time, though, gold and silver can be expected to maintain their purchasing power regardless of what they are priced at in terms of national currencies. The same cannot be said for all hard assets. Some people hoard diamonds in the belief that they are as good as gold. That's just not true anymore. These days, diamonds can be manufactured in laboratories. And these aren't fake diamonds we're talking about. They're the real thing. Lab-grown diamonds now starting to hit mainstream jewelry stores. Although they cost 20 to 50% less than mine diamonds, make no mistake, these aren't fakes. They're real and indistinguishable from mined stones. You may not find a lab-grown diamond at your local jeweler today, but more than likely, it won't be long. Now we're at a place where it's ready for prime time because, first of all, the quality is good enough, the supply is starting to emerge, and more than that, the consumer is, uh, I think they want to get more value for their money. While it's possible to create synthetic gold at the atomic level, 
it's extraordinarily costly to do so. There is no practical way to create something as substantial as an ounce of gold in a laboratory. Unlike a diamond, which is just carbon compressed by earthly forces, gold is a basic element that was created from exploding stars. For all practical purposes, the amount of gold available to be extracted is finite. By contrast, there is no fixed limit to the number of diamonds that can be produced. There's also no limit to the number of bonds or equity shares that can be issued. No limit to the number of dollars the Fed can create and no limit to how high the national debt can grow. We've seen that the so-called debt ceiling is mostly a farce because it always gets raised at the demand of the administration in power. The fact that gold is and will always be scarce is why gold is and will always be a sought-after store of value. Well, now for more on precious metal scarcity, massive physical demand, and the possibility of the cyclical bear market in gold and silver prices finally coming to an end in perhaps the very near term, let's get right to this week's exclusive interview. It is my privilege now to be joined by David Smith, senior analyst at the Morgan Report and regular contributor to MoneyMetals.com. David, it's great to talk with you again, and it's good to have you back on. How are you? It's good to be back, Mike. I'm I'm feeling great and uh, watching the daily moves in the market. Uh, interesting as always. Well, David, perhaps the biggest news right now in the in the gold and silver world that uh, you and I live in is the extreme leverage we're seeing in in the major exchanges in London and the and the U.S. in recent weeks. For instance, there are now more than 300 ounces of paper gold on the COMEX for every one ounce of physical metal backing those contracts. Now, December is usually a big delivery month, and a few observers have said that we are nearing a point where the exchanges could see a default, but there's been uh, talk about potential defaults for years, and they haven't happened. So what are your thoughts about what's going on with the trading exchanges in the West? Well, sometimes it seems like a Chinese water torture, you know, where there's just a drip, drip, drip. But I really think that they're... Uh, the fundamental underpinnings are really changing as investors, uh, like the people that talk to you every day on the phone and buy metals from Money Metals, uh, they are buying more and more of the physical, and they're putting it away. And so the physical is coming more and more to be where the price discovery is. It's not there yet, but it's well on the way, rather than the futures traders, which uh, buy and sell paper metal. They never take delivery of it, and they have extreme leverage, as you mentioned. If you can imagine someone coming to you, Mike, and buying $50,000 worth of silver, uh, and, and they would have to pay you know, the full amount for that, but imagine somebody on the futures exchange, they, they would go to buy the same 50,000 ounces, but they put up 128th as much, about 3% of the cost. They can control 28 to 30 times as much silver as that person that had to pay the full amount. And so they go in and they buy these contracts and sell them and, and move the price up and down like a yo-yo to make money on it, uh, and they can do it with a very small down payment. Now, of course, if they're wrong on the direction, they have to reverse course and they take small profit or a large loss if they're wrong. But over time, what they do is they make it a lot harder for those of us that buy and hold the physical to understand, you know, what the true price is. And the thing with that is that when they make these large moves, people that are trying to buy the physical sometimes have to pay a lot more because the premiums go up. So it makes it complicated, and it's an unfair deal, but it, it's the way it is. But the thing is, with the purchase more and more of physical, it's taking it off the market. At some point, the paper traders aren't going to be able to push prices around because price discovery will move to the physical markets, such as what they're doing in Shanghai and Dubai, rather than the paper pusher markets that we see in the COMEX in New York and Chicago. That kind of leads me right into my next uh, discussion point here. I want to read you an excerpt from our Monday market update uh, from this week and then get your comments. In it, our colleague uh, Clint Signer writes, Skyrocketing leverage in the COMEX isn't the only extreme for metals investors to pay attention to. The positioning, long versus short, of swap dealers, who are largely represented by the bullion banks, relative to managed money, largely comprised of hedge funds and other speculators, is also in uncharted territory, and it may be good news for the bulls. Managed money has been building toward a net short position in recent weeks, providing much of the push for lower spot prices. In the most recent CFTC Commitment of Traders report, dated December 1st, the crowd was positioned a record 55.1% short. Six weeks ago, this number was only 17.3%. Meanwhile, the bullion banks, swap dealers, have been going long, 
a record 64.2% long to be exact. What does this mean? Well, if history is a guide, it means the bullion banks are about to take the speculative shorts out to the woodshed. Data shows that when managed money and the swap dealers build extreme positions in opposing directions, a change in price trend is likely coming, and the swap dealers, banks, rarely, if ever, lose. You've been following the metals and commodities markets for a long time, David. Uh, comment on this statement and, and fill us in on your experience about what this sort of thing means. Well, these reports that you just mentioned, uh, Mike, are published on a weekly basis, and they're a tool. They're not uh, they're a diagnostic tool, but they're an important one to show the mentality of the markets at any given time. What do the players think is going to happen? And of those players, what categories tend to be right the most often? As you mentioned, the swap dealers, the people that actually move this metal around that don't just move it by paper, they have a, a pretty good track record, especially at major turns. And when they're massively short uh say silver, it, it indicates that they feel it's going to go lower before it goes higher. And if they're flat or if they're a bit on the long side or quite a bit long, it can mean the opposite. And some of the statistics you quoted of the swap dealers and the, uh, on being on the long side, some of these statistics are the best they've been in 14 years since before the silver bull market that really originally got underway. And so this is very bullish, and it doesn't mean that you go out and mortgage your house to buy silver, but what it means is that the underpinnings and the infrastructure of the silver market are becoming internally stronger, even though when you look at the price on a chart, we can't say for sure that that's the case. And so the, the hedge funds uh, and the, the public money, it tends to be money that uh, follows the herd, and they tend to be wrong at major turns, and then they have to get taken out, and the guys on the other side deprive them of their money. So I feel pretty confident that what's going on here with these swap dealers is something that's really important to pay attention to. And to my thinking, it really lowers the risk-reward of adding to a person's position in here because we're near major support, and uh, we had this very strong rally last week on Friday, which is begrudgingly giving it up a little bit each day. It's been the prices have been soft this week, but the point being is that it's having to chew down through support, and so it's going to be interesting to see how the things get handled here, even tomorrow, but certainly in the next week, uh, because we're in a, a month that can be very volatile. And um, to my way of thinking, the risk-reward really favors people that want to either initiate new physical positions by buying the, the precious metals, both gold and silver, and or who wish to add to their positions while the price is a little bit on the quiet side and spreads tend to shrink a little bit. And all that can be helpful in, in enabling you to get a better price than it would be if you bought after a big announcement day where the gold is up 25 or $30 and silver is up 75 cents. Yeah, it definitely does seem to be a lot of value in here, and, and we do uh, appear to be building quite a, a base of support going back uh, for a while now, maybe double, triple bottom even in silver, around $14. And, yeah, I guess we've heard the term short-covering rally. Is that uh, sort of what we're talking about here with the potential for all these speculators to uh, be forced to get out of their positions, and, and that just drives the price up higher? Is, is that uh, the definition of a short-covering rally or, or what could be a yeah, short-covering rally? Yeah, uh, that's part of the crowd-feeding behavior that takes place when, when prices turn. And when the shorts go in, this is kind of arcane for a lot of people to study. And, but it, it's basically if you go in on the short side, you're, you're selling something you don't own. And the way to uh, offset the position to put you to neutral is to buy it back at the end. The other way, of course, is to buy something that you would like to own, and then you have to sell it in order to get back to a neutral position. So the shorts have to cover at some point, and they have to buy back what they sold, which adds further fuel to the market when it's moving up. And if it's already moving up in a strong way, then that can make it very explosive on the upside. So the, the bigger the short position you have into support like this, the more volatile it can become if the shorts are wrong and they turn around. And so a lot of the public that's trading these uh, futures markets think the price is going to go down, and they tend to be wrong at major turns. And if they're wrong, they have to cover quickly. And then you add physical buying to that where people go out and they go, oh, the paper price is rising, so I better buy some physical. And then you have the spreads widen, widen and it becomes kind of a contagion that feeds on itself. So you're correct that the short covering rally is a significant um, element in what can cause a very strong rally to develop, and it could even be strong enough to change the, uh, the major trend uh, back to a bullish market that's been in a kind of a cyclical bear trend for the past four years. And there are a couple of analysts that I follow closely that feel that this is exactly what has the potential 
of developing, and there's never a guarantee, but when the probabilities favor you, you can feel more comfortable in going ahead with what you would like to do, even if you're a little bit uh, cautious about doing it than if you're just not sure. But the tea leaves are starting to look better and better, and I do think when these metals make a real sustained move to the upside that suddenly becomes a trend that doesn't turn around and go down again, it's going to change the whole tenor of the market perhaps for a long, long time to come. I guess it was late 2010, early 2011, the last time we saw a really uh, ferocious uh, short-covering rally, and it can be quite explosive and interesting just to sort of sit back and watch. It'll be uh, neat to see if that uh, finally does happen again. Long time coming for a lot of uh, precious metals investors if we do finally see uh, some sort of event like that. Uh, now, silver is a, is a byproduct uh, of other mining, with much of it uh, mined in conjunction with, say, copper and zinc and lead. Uh, now, those uh, base metals have been taken a beating, and you have to think that e- even though the mining stocks are finally starting to show signs of life, uh, there is significantly less exploration going on right now as these miners are, are having a rough go of it for the most part. Uh, how is this likely to affect silver production and silver supply in the coming months and years, given the current price environment, talking specifically about uh, the base metal mining and the fact that, what is it, uh, 75%, David, is uh, of silver is mined as a byproduct? Is that, a, is that about right? It depends, but it's, it runs around 65 to 70 percent. About two thirds of the silver that's mined every year comes uh, from production of, of base metals, copper, lead, and zinc, and, and sometimes gold, which is not a base metal, of course. But it's, what this does, it means that uh, when these companies cut back, with, for example, copper prices being low and zinc, is that less silver is being produced by definition. In addition, as you mentioned, the longer-term concern, because we've actually looks like we're going to have a silver deficit this year in relation to production versus demand, and a bigger one next year, is that the uh, exploration for new deposits is cut way back. And the last figure I saw for the mining sector in general is something like uh, 5 to $6 billion in further exploration costs uh, projected have been cut back over the next few years. And so this means there's going to be a lot less exploration, a lot less extra delineation of uh, deposits that are already known, and that's going to crimp the supply even more. So these elements of cutting back on the available supply, and if the demand from investors continues to stay strong, uh, you're going to see that gap widen, and then that's what causes more uh, price volatility and ultimately leads to substantially higher prices in the metal that's being affected, in this case silver, and to a certain extent gold as well. In the last few months, we've seen a bit of a disconnect emerge between the miners and the metals. Uh, The mining sector looks to be building considerable internal strength when you look at the charts. Uh, Even as the physicals are moving sideways and even down, what's going on there? The mining stocks themselves, uh, not across the board, but as a category, and especially looking at the stronger miners who have cut their costs and, and kept their production in line and things like this, uh, they're forming very interesting chart patterns. Some of them are making double and triple do- uh, bottoms. Some of them are moving in the classic definition of a bull market, which is um, higher lows and higher highs. <clears throat> and on days when the physical prices are driven down by the paper traders that we discussed earlier today, their stock gives ground only begrudgingly, if at all. And it really there's an indication that strong hands are moving in to buy these stocks and hold on to them because they know that the turn is coming and it's already evolving and that when this thing gets underway, by the time it becomes obvious to the public that the mining stocks will be substantially higher and, of course, the price of the physical will be as well. So to me, this is a very positive development and it's one that evolves over time, but it's one that has continued to take place really over the last few months, even as the physical prices have kind of struggled in here. You've uh, been teamed with David Morgan for a while now, and you guys obviously take a very close look at the mining sector and and, uh, find those value plays, and and it's really good advice that a lot of people can get by uh, following that. And then also the Silver Manifesto. I know uh, we we are both big fans of of that book, a fantastic work there by uh, David Morgan and and Chris Marchese. A lot of this stuff is uh, discussed in in depth, uh, these sort of subjects that we're talking about today. And uh, I guess a lot of what people can learn about the silver market they can find in, in that that book. 
They really can, and you know, David and Chris did an excellent job on this book, and it's been very well received, as you mentioned. And we were at the Silver Summit here just in uh, late November. There's a lot of interest in the book, and a lot of interest in talking to all of us on the team about the Silver story. And the thing about you know uh, the Silver Manifesto, this time of year, heck, it makes a great Christmas gift or just a great gift giving. I mean, my brother was born two days after Christmas, so it doesn't have to be a Christmas gift. It can be a birthday gift, you know. And uh, it will arm people with the knowledge that, that they need to feel more comfortable about moving forward in, in either acquiring a, a precious metals position or adding to one that they already have. Because don't think of it when you buy gold and silver, the physical, don't think of it as spending money to buy something like you're going to buy a boat or a fishing pole. You're exchanging a form of fiat money that doesn't have any backing to it and has other claims on it for real sound money that's been around for thousands of years that has no claim on it other than the person being you that's holding it in your hand. And this is something when you start looking at it a different way, you don't see yourself as, oh, I'm stacking up on cases of pork and beans. I'm actually buying money that holds its value and that has only the claim on it of me holding it in my hand. And it causes you to look at the silver story in a much, much different way. Yeah, tremendous amount of uh, meat in that book, and uh, definitely urge people to uh, to check that out if they haven't already. Now, kind of hitting on the investor psychology uh, here a bit, uh, since you're very good on that subject and have written a lot about it over the years, and I always appreciate your insights and uh, just your your discipline and, and your uh, even keel approach to investing. Uh, one thing that, that people often don't keep in mind is that if you're looking at, to buy physical metal, and let's focus on silver here for the sake of this discussion, and if we're sitting here at, say, four $14 an ounce, give or take, and, and someone is saying, well, I'm going to hold out for silver to get to $12 and then buy the physical then. Only problem is that with there being such little margin on the supply side, we would see premiums skyrocket, not to mention lead time issues as well developing. And a bullion investor is more than likely going to end up paying the same or possibly even more for you know Silver Eagles, for instance, uh, even if we had a price drop like that on spot prices because the premium uh, could rise just as much as the spot price went down. Talk about this dynamic. Well, you know, Mike, that's already happened a couple times this year, most uh, pronounced in the junk silver market, the 90% bags of silver dimes and quarters and 50-cent pieces that used to circulate in our pockets when we were growing up. And it sure had a different feel then than the stuff you do now. You almost hate to look at it. At any rate, the premiums, as you mentioned, uh, can widen uh, very quickly and get to almost absurd levels so that if you said, let's say, oh, I, you know, I'll wait till silver drops to 12, assuming it ever does, well, it might drop to 12, but you you still might pay the same premium that you would if you bought it today, so you, you wouldn't be saving anything. And that, not only that, it assumes that even if the, the product is even available there. So it really makes sense to buy over time in tranches or portions, and it makes sense to kind of buy when it's hard for you to do it. If it's really easy and you're absolutely certain that you're going to make a killing, it might not be the best time. But if you're a little bit nervous, but you think, you know, I still I believe in the story and I, I know that what I'm doing is right and I'll buy a portion of what I need, you're going to find over time that your dollar cost average puts you in a much better position. You can sleep better at night and you'll have what you want without paying an inordinate price for it. And I really think that these spikes in premiums that we've seen a couple times this year, not only just with junk silver, but with the American Silver Eagles and with the bullion uh, rounds themselves, these are importance of things to come. These price spikes are going to become more frequent. They're going to become more pronounced. They're going to get bigger. And they're going to be harder and harder for individual investors and uh, the sellers themselves to deal with because they're going to be on a bigger scale. And they're, they're just like the tremors of an earthquake before a major quake. You have a lot of these little quakes that are trying to release pressure. And that's what's happened in the pressure of the, you know, of the supply demand in the silver market. And when the really big tremor hits, uh, pe people are going to go, oh, my gosh, and now I really should have done something, but it will be too late. So take advantage when the little tremors subside and, and, and add to your position, and don't try to time it because nobody gets it right. Some of the best people in the business are wrong quite a while before they get it right. But, boy, when the payday comes down the line, they, they're really happy that they did what was the right thing. And over time, their wealth can increase in a very big way by doing that type of a thing. 
Yeah, certainly dollar cost averaging, keeping some powder dry, and uh, checking your emotions at the door when uh, when buying is uh, all uh, good advice. Uh, and, and cheap is cheap, and there's only so low it can go. And, and if you're going to buy the physical, you're likely to see long delays and sky-high premiums if spot prices drop much further. Always something to keep in mind. Uh, right. Now. Now, we've certainly seen unbelievable physical demand this year. You alluded to that a moment ago, and, and you have to think that something is going to give. I mean, at what point does massive demand in the face of dwindling supply uh, become an explosive event for higher prices, David? Nobody can predict that exact point, Mike, but you know, uh, when I look at the fact that, that India is going to be buying more than 40% of the world's production of silver this year, and China, by definition, has purchased more gold than was produced this year. Those two entities alone, uh, th- that's a huge consideration, and it's a trend that just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And then you look at the, uh, uh, there's going to be a record set this year, if it, it has not already done so, in American silver eagles and Canadian silver maple leaves. And uh, the investors are really stepping up to the plate, and they're a very small percentage of American investors and Canadian investors right now. But that is growing. And so there's so many reasons why this trend has got a long ways to go. And when the trend turns, prices are going to be higher probably for years at a time after they've lowered. And I think people trying to quibble in here of waiting, oh, maybe it'll drop 50 cents or a dollar or two dollars. I mean, the, the upside is so enormous that to worry about something on the downside, especially if you're not buying on margin. I mean, we're, we're not futures traders where we're leveraging 28 times our money. We're paying physical cash for it. We're taking delivery. It's not on margin. Nobody's going to give us a margin call, and you can sleep at night. And you put that product away in a safe place, and you kind of keep it to yourself that you own it, and you just wait for the inevitable change to take place, and then at some point down the line, probably a number of years, when you have a public mania on the other side, like we saw in 2000 with the dot-com mania and the real estate mania in 2006, then you can sell some of your product <clears throat> into the market and you can make a very good profit while other people are lining up at the door to buy what you have to sell. And that's how you come out ahead in these markets. Not to mention it's an insurance policy. And um, the last time I heard, uh, nobody complained that uh, they had car insurance last year and they had to pay, but they didn't have a wreck. Because they know if they had a wreck, that insurance could keep them in a safe position financially. And that's part of what you're trying to do when you buy the metals. It's insurance first and profit second. The story is so compelling that it looks to me like both of those imperatives are going to be satisfied with people that add to their positions anywhere in the price range that we've been seeing over the last six months or so. Definitely seems like the risk reward uh, possibility here is is uh, very bullish uh, for the to the reward side. Uh, well, finally, David, before we close, uh, what are you expecting as we begin to turn the calendar and move into 2016? What do you think the new year will bring for metals prices and metals investors? Will we finally see an uptrend after a few rough years? I really think that after four years of this water torture and prices giving way to lower support. Uh, and, and, you know, this looks so much like what I experienced in the late 1970s when, uh, you know, gold dropped in value by half and, and silver gave up most of its gains that it had made the last couple of years. And there wasn't any indication at all that things were going to be any different. And then suddenly prices started moving upward in a way that was absolutely amazing. I remember when silver went to $12 and people were just thinking that was amazing. And then it was 18 and the next it was in the 20s. And it topped out at around fifty dollars, and so this is going to happen again. That Richard Russell, who passed away recently, who's the doyen of newsletter writers, I think he wrote a letter for like fifty-three years. He said, "I have never ever seen a bull market that did not end with a speculative third phase, and those, that third phase becomes a public mania, whether it's." dot-com stocks or real estate, or it's going to be the same in gold and silver. And we have not had that third phase yet. We've had the second phase, which ended in April and May of 2011. But that third phase is on the way. It's building its base right now. And when it takes off, it's going to be really something. It's going to be one for the record books. This is something that David Morgan has said is going to happen, as long said, and the evidence supports it. And he also mentions that his research, uh, which is supported by deep work that's been done by the whole Morgan Report team, indicates that up to 80 to 90 percent of the entire profit potential of the full bore market will be realized in the last 10 percent in time 
of that price rise. So we'll see prices go up substantially from here, and then at some point they're going to go vertical. And I think people will be shocked when they see the potential that happens during that vertical phrase. And so I'd love to see and hear that everybody listening to this had some way to participate, even if in a very small way, in what's coming. Just buy your metal in tranches, uh, pay cash for it, put it away in a safe place, and then just wait. Don't obsess every day and follow the charts every day, but know that that first leg is going to be underway at some point, and when it is, you're going to be very happy that you've been able to participate uh, rather than to just watch. Well, thanks very much for your time, David. Always excellent insights and uh, a calming voice. I love uh, speaking to you. You've got a a way of making things uh, make sense for a lot of people, and and we certainly look forward to talking with you again real soon. I hope you have a a Merry Christmas, and also uh, enjoy your weekend, my friend. Well, thank you, Mike. And, you know, I always enjoy speaking with you guys, and uh, it helps me clarify my own thoughts and positions. And uh, I'm fully supportive of what what is going on uh, now with what we're doing, and I think it's the right thing, I think it's the honorable thing, and I think it's the financially uh, prudent thing to be doing. So uh, you have a great uh, holiday season at your group as well. Check out any of David's insightful columns. Just go to the news section on moneymetals.com or type in David Smith in the search box, and you'll get links to all of his work. Be sure to check that out. Well, that will do it for this week. Thanks again to David Smith, contributor to MoneyMetals.com and senior analyst at The Morgan Report. And check back here next Friday for our next weekly market wrap podcast. Until then, this has been Mike Leeson with Money Metals Exchange. Thanks for listening, and have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this week's Money Metals podcast. Be sure to come back next week. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes for answers to all of your questions or to discreetly and securely buy or sell gold or silver coins, bars, and rounds. Call 1-800-800-1865 or visit www.moneymetals.com. Our knowledgeable and no-pressure specialists are standing by between 7 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Mountain Time, Monday through Friday. Or you can lock in your order online, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Again, visit us at www.moneymetals.com or call 1-800-800-1865.